It's a very common disease, but oftentimes I see uh, patients, young, middle-aged, old, that have been suffering from a lot of symptoms for a very long time. They're just undiagnosed and uh, they hear a lot of things like, oh, that's a normal period, becoming a woman, things like that, or, or, or your threshold for pain is low. <laughs> Hello people, welcome to ChatterDocs. I'm Dr. Tor and I'm an internal medicine physician. In this show, I talk about so many things in medicine and I like to believe that learning about health and medicine does not have to be boring. So if you're new here, please don't forget subscribing and turning on the notifications so you won't miss anything. Today, I'm very happy to have a friend of mine, Dr. Karen Tang here with me on a call. She is a gynecologist surgeon who specializes in minimal invasive surgery. She's also a public figure. She has a YouTube channel channel, Instagram account, TikTok, and her name is Karen Tang MD. I'm gonna put links down below in the description so you can follow her as well. And today we're gonna talk about a very common condition, endometriosis. But first, let me say hi to Karen. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on, Sam. Good, good. Thank you for giving us your time. So um, tell me something about yourself outside the world of medicine. Oh, sure. You know, I have three kids. As you said, we live just outside of Philadelphia. But, you know, I've been doing social media for the past maybe two, three years, um, mostly to try and educate and, you know, get the word out about reproductive health, especially, you know, women's health, gynecologic health. Um, these are topics that are, you know, so commonly experienced by so many people, but a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about with friends or family members or even their doctors. And so people are going on to social media to try and find some answers and, you know, Know, get information about what they might be going through. So especially for things like endometriosis, which is, you know, one of the conditions I treat most commonly, uh, affects so many people, up to one in 10 women or girls, um, but a lot of people don't get diagnosed for many, many years. And so they actually suffer for a long time before they get relief. Tell me, what is endometriosis? So endometriosis is a common condition. Um, it is where tissue that looks very much like the tissue that normally grows inside the cavity of the uterus, and that is called endometrial tissue. Something that looks a lot like that grows outside of the uterus. Um, and common places for it to grow are between the uterus and the rectum, or on the walls of the pelvis, or on the surface of the bladder, or inside the ovaries in the form of a cyst. And so um, common you know, issues with it is that it is very inflammatory. So it can inflame all of those things that we just mentioned, your your bladder, you know, the other organs, um, and causes mostly really bad pain. So um, people have really severe pain with their periods, pain with ovulation, um, pain with intercourse. And then if it affects the other organs nearby, it can cause really terrible like bowel symptoms. Like people get a lot of like constipation, diarrhea, pain with bowel movements, or, you know, bladder pain, that sort of thing. Is there any specific characters to this pain that makes it different from normal period pain that people uh, should be aware of? Yeah, and that's part of the difficulty diagnosing kind of especially when people are young you know teenagers it's very very common for teenagers to have pretty painful periods that you know in, in many situations may improve over time as they get older or with birth control um, so initially it feels very similar to just bad period cramps um, you know usually it's sort of a cramping pain to start um, you know later on as it gets worse and worse it can become more sharp or stabbing in quality um, but in general what I tell people to be looking out for especially if you're younger is you know uh, pain with periods shouldn't be so bad that it's affecting your ability to function or to do the things that you want to do in life. So typically for someone who's young, um, you know, in school, like these are the uh, girls who are like missing school a lot or having to kind of call out of school um, because they, you know, can barely get out of bed. They're in so much pain. Um, you know, when you're older, you're having to miss a lot of work. Um, things like ibuprofen or over-the-counter medicines aren't enough to control your symptoms. So if you're trying that um, and you're still having a ton of pain, especially to the degree that that it is keeping you from functioning normally, that's where you really want to, to see a gynecologist and, and get evaluated. So, so how do we diagnose this condition? So part of the difficulty with diagnosis is the only way we can find it for sure is actually with surgery. Um, and then the reason for that is because usually when it you know grows, especially kind of early on, it's very small. So I use the example of it's almost like you took a pen and drew dots on a piece of paper. It tends to almost never show up on imaging studies. So meaning that oftentimes people will go 
to the emergency room with severe pain or their doctor will order an ultrasound and they'll come back and say, oh, it looks totally normal, there's nothing wrong. So oftentimes, you know, these patients may even get like CAT scans, ultrasounds that come back perfectly fine and it makes it seem like there's nothing wrong. Um, the issue, like I said, is that then the only way to diagnose it is actually use your eyes, which we have to do during what's called laparoscopic surgery. We put a thin camera into the abdomen, uh, we fill the abdomen with gas so we can see and then truly just use our eyes and just look for you know, lesions of endometriosis. We then have to remove it, you know, cut it out and send it to a pathologist who says, yes, under the microscope, that is endometrial-like tissue. And that's how you get your diagnosis. Also part of the treatment is to remove as much as we can surgically. There are some there are some people doing research now on less invasive methods, um, things like, um, you know, like, uh, like different genetic testing or like um, endometrial biopsy, which is still invasive. It's getting a sample of tissue from inside the cavity of the uterus through the vagina. So it's still invasive, but but definitely not as invasive as doing a surgery. So there are people doing some studies on this. Um, the, the hope is to someday have a little bit of a better test that doesn't require surgery, but um, currently that's what we have. There's a whole lot you could say about kind of like um, gender inequalities. If it affected men and caused super severe pain and pain with bowel movements and pain with sex and you know made people like debilitating pain, like we would probably know a little bit more about it. Something we haven't touched on yet is, is fertility issues. But oftentimes what happens is that because it can cause fertility issues. Some women don't even get diagnosed until they're actually having fertility problems and it comes up in the context of evaluation for fertility issues. Um, you know, they actually, you know, when you ask them, we're like, oh yeah, I've always had horribly painful periods, but I thought that was normal because I asked someone and they said it was normal. Um, so they just sort of keep on going with their life until it's really progressed pretty badly. And so. But that brings me to my next question. What are the treatments available for this condition? So in general, like I said, the main treatment is surgical removal. So um, in general, where the endometriosis grows is on the surfaces of the tissues. There's something called peritoneum, which is basically a clear coating that covers everything in the abdomen and pelvis. And I explain it to patients and on social media um, that it's almost like there's like a saran wrap. There's kind of a clear coating that grows over everything. And so usually what we do is we sort of pick up that coating and cut out the little bit of endometriosis that's growing on it. That coating just grows again. So it's not that there's like holes left behind. It will kind of grow again. Uh, sometimes it's deeper. Sometimes you actually have to kind of dissect down into some of the deeper tissues to get it out. And then in this most extreme form, um, it actually starts to invade into other organs like the rectum and the colon or the bladder, uh, almost as if it's a cancer. It's not a cancer itself, but it kind of grows into other things. Um, so in those cases, the surgery is very, very complicated. So sometimes even like bowel resections and things. Um, in general, we also kind of use medical management as an adjunct. So hormonal suppression can help with things like pain or you know potentially kind of keep it a little bit under control to keep it from progressing too much. Um, so the first line is is usually something like birth control, mostly because a lot of reproductive age, you know, like women may require contraception anyway. So usually the first step is to give them some sort of hormonal birth control. Um, endometriosis is, is we think fed or stimulated by estrogen from your ovaries. So if you drop that estrogen and quiet the ovaries, it should improve some of the pain and the symptoms. Um, so basically all hormonal birth controls kind of function in that way. Um, and then also there are other medications that are a little bit more kind of we call them like bigger guns um, where you're actually like really significantly quieting the ovaries there's medications like something called oralissa and lupron which basically kind of work to suppress the ovary function uh, they're not meant to be taken forever because um, we don't want to put people into like a menopause state early on there's lots of health risks with that um, but they can help kind of temporarily with uh, symptoms like say waiting for surgery or you know if people are busy with work or their children and they can't take time off to have a surgery or recover from surgery and they want to use medical management to help with their symptoms, then those are good options. So, so medication are not a cure for this condition. They just they just um, decrease the symptoms and they just treat the patient's uh, overall condition, but the cure will come only with surgery. Exactly, yeah. Hopefully. So surgical removal is the only way to kind of fully remove it, mm -hmm. but we can help me with medications to kind of help with some symptoms. And sometimes if patients don't have like very severe symptoms, like medication mm -hmm. may be all that they need. Mm -hmm. So that's why we typically start with medications like birth controls just to see if it's enough to kind of control symptoms. I always tell people it's a quality of life treatment. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like something like cancer where it's like you if you have this you need 
this treatment. Um, you know, we always present to patients like, what do you feel like would help you the most and help you meet your goals for treatment? Mm -hmm. What are the, the long-term implications of this condition on patient's life? And what can they do to cope with these, um, to basically mitigate the effects? So um, chronic pain, and, and you know this from just kind of helping with chronic pain patients in general, um, is very tied into mental health, depression, anxiety, stress. And so in general, like for my patients with chronic pain, almost 100% of them have coexisting depression, anxiety, stress. Um, and so I always tell them the management of those mental health issues and mood issues is part of helping with their pain because it's sort of a cycle. People with um, severe pain will tend to have more depression, anxiety, and the more depression, anxiety, the worse their pain experience. That's actually been very well studied. So to help mitigate and minimize some of the pain, we actually have to help them make sure they're, they're um, connected to a mental health professional to help with management of any coexisting issues. Um, and uh, like I said, that's that's for just kind of their overall well-being and also to better help with their pain control. Um, same thing with things like, um, you know, like dietary um, triggers. A lot of people notice that there could be worse symptoms if they eat certain foods, kind of so-called inflammatory foods like the red meats and dairy and sugar. Um, so a lot of people like will, will kind of watch what they eat and try and avoid certain things and notice that they actually will feel better if they just sort of adjust certain, you know, lifestyle modifications or dietary modifications. And also that, that brings me to this point that I wanted to mention. There's this, this great website. It's called I Care Better. I will uh, link it uh, down below as well in, in the descriptions. Um, and that can help patients with endometriosis that they actually focus only on endometriosis. They help patients find this, um, you know, a, a good surgeon for whatever problem they have, a good certified surgeon in their area, and also other uh, support uh, professionals like physical therapists, mental health professionals and stuff like that. Thank you so much that was great uh, do you have any other points or any take-home points anything you want to mention yeah well actually um, associated with what you were just saying with how to get help basically so there are a couple of other resources that people can access online uh, so another really huge support group something called Nancy's Nook I think they're on Facebook and then they have a website now um, they also maintain like a surgeon list um, and so they have a lot of different like kind of like educational resources and, and things like that and then um, also just in general to find um, you know minimally invasive surgeons you know my field uh, we do extra training, uh, not just in the, the surgery, but also management of chronic pelvic pain. Um, and so uh, you can also look on the AAGL.org website, so American Association for Gynecologic Laparoscopists. The pelvic physical therapy, I almost forgot, that is very, very, very helpful. Um, I send almost all of my patients for pelvic physical therapy. Um, because things like endometriosis are very inflammatory, the other things that can inflame are the muscles of your pelvis. And so oftentimes people will have muscular pain or functional issues with their muscles that affect things like bowel function and bladder function and they really really improve a lot of times with physical therapy so um, that's very important I almost always am referring my endometriosis patients also to a pelvic floor physical therapist too thanks Karen again for answering all, all our questions we're gonna do another video on this topic this is a broad topic and we're gonna debunk the myths around endometriosis so stay tuned for that thanks for watching as always and don't forget sharing this video and subscribing to my channel and as always Take it easy, we're all gonna die someday.